Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for gathering together to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. So this week, we are in Parshat Noah, which if you'd like to follow along, you can find beginning in chapter 6 with verse 9 in the book of Genesis. We will read through the English translation uh, of our Torah portion. And then I will share with you a little bit of a focused study of the weekly portion. And then we'll open it up for our general conversation where everyone will have an opportunity to share his or her thoughts, reflections about this week's portion. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute at this time, together we can recite our blessing, giving thanks for this opportunity. Baru Ata Adonai Elohim Elohim Asher Kanu Mitzvot Mitzivon Asosok Kibrei Ora. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. We begin Book of Genesis, chapter six, with verse nine. I'll share with you the opening verses. And then I'll, I'll provide everyone opportunity to have an, uh, to, to read some verses. This is the line of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his age. Noah walked with God. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. Richard, would you like to read a little bit, beginning of verse 11? Yes, thank you, Emma. The earth became corrupt before God. The earth was filled with injustice. And God saw how corrupt the earth was, for all flesh had corrupted its ways on earth. God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to all flesh, for the earth is filled with lawless men because of them. I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make it an ark of compartments and covered inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Make an opening for daylight in the ark and terminate it with a cubit of the top, within a cubit of the top. Put the entrance to the ark in its side. Make it with bottom, second, and third decks. Thank you. Sherry, would you like to read a little bit, beginning at verse 17? Thank you. Uh, for my part, I'm about to, to bring the, the flood, waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh under the sky in which there is breath of life. Everything on earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark with your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. And of all that lives, of all flesh, you shall take two of each into the ark to keep alive with you. They shall be male and female, from the birds of every kind, cattle of every kind, every kind of creeping thing on earth. Two of each shall come to you to stay alive. For your part, take of everything that is eaten and store it away to serve as food for you and for them. Noah did so, just as God commanded him. Thank and so he did. Thank you. Steve, you want to read a little bit at the start of chapter 7? And then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark with all your household, for you alone have I found righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean animal, you shall take seven pairs, males and their mates, and of every animal that is not clean, too a male and its mate, of the birds of the sky also, seven pairs, male and female, to keep sea alive upon all the earth. For in the seventh day's time, I will make it rain upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the earth all existence that I created, and know it did just as the Lord commanded him. Thank you, Z. Anna, do you want to read a little bit at verse 6 of chapter 7? Noah was 600 years old when the flood came, waters upon the earth. Noah, with his sons, 
his wife, his son's wives came into the ark on account of the deluge of the pure beasts and the beasts that were not pure of the birds and all that creep on the earth. Two by two, they came to Noah to the ark, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. After seven days, the flood waters covered the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep broke out and the sky's floodgates opened. Rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and nights. Thank you. We're now on verse 13. June, would you like to read a little bit there, starting at verse 13? Thank you, Rabbi. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth and the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark, they and every beast after its kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after its kind and every fowl after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bore upon the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high mountains that were under the whole he heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward, the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh perished that moved upon the earth, both fowl and cattle and beast, and every swarming thing that swarmeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, whatsoever was in the dry land, died. Should I continue? Sure, why don't you finish that last verse 23? And he blotted out every living substance which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping thing, and fowl of the heaven, and they were blotted out from the earth, and Noah only was left, and they that were with him in the ark. Thank and you. And then Mark, why don't you read, uh, starting at verse 24, and continue into chapter 8. And you'll have to unmute. Uh, I'm going to have to pass. I have mouse print on my Tanakh. And it's okay. difficult for me to read. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, Mark. So we're on uh, verse 24, of chapter 7. And David and Susan, would you like to read a little bit there? First, uh, verse 24. Chapter 7. Yes. Okay. Uh, Are we unmuted? Yes, go. Okay. Then, yeah, this is an altar. And the waters surged over the earth 150 days. And God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God sent a word, a wind over the earth, and the waters subsided, and the wellsprings of the deep were dammed up in the casements of the heavens. The rain from the heavens held back. And the waters receded from the earth little by little, and the waters ebbed. At the end of 150 days, the ark came to rest on the seventh day of the seventh month on the mountains of Ararat. Uh, and this is Richard Friedman. And the waters went on receding until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first of the month, the tops of the mountains appeared. And it was at the end of 40 days, and Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made, and he let a raven go, and it went back and forth over the water. It, it went back and forth until the water dried up from the earth, 
And he let a dove go from him to see whether the waters had eased from the face of the earth. And the dove did not find a resting place for its foot. And it came back to him, to the ark. For waters were on the face of the earth. And he put out his hand and took it and brought it to him, to the ark. And he waited still another seven days. And again, he let a dove go from the ark. And the dove came to him in the evening time. And here was an olive leaf torn off in its mouth. And no one knew that the waters had eased from the earth. And he waited still another seven days. And he let a dove go. And it did not come back to him ever again. And it was in the 601st year, in the first month, in the first of the month, the waters dried from the earth. And Noah turned back the covering of the ark and looked, and here the face of the earth had dried. And in the seventh month, seventh, second month, in the 27th day of the month, the earth dried up. Thank you so much, both of you. And let me invite Margo. Would you like to read a little bit starting at verse 15? <laughs> Happily. God spoke to Noah saying, come out of the ark together with your wife, your sons, and your son's wives, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds, animals, and everything that creeps on the earth, and let them swarm on the earth and be fertile and increase on earth. So Noah came out together with his sons, his wife, and his son's wives. Every animal, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that stirs on earth came out of the ark by the fam by families. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and, ta and, and taking of every clean animal and of every clean bird, he offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord swelled, sm uh, it's a, smelled, the Lord smelled, that's interesting, with, um, oh, oh, he smelled the pleasant odor. Uh, and the Lord said to himself, never again will I doom the earth because of man, since the devisings of man's mind are evil and from his youth, nor will I ever again destroy everything living as I have done. So long as the earth endures, seeding and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Thank you, Margo. And Dave Lev, would you like to read, starting with the beginning of chapter nine? God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fertile and increase and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you shall be upon all the beasts of the earth and upon all the birds of the sky, everything with which the earth is astir and upon all the fish in the sea. They are given unto your hand. Every creature that lives shall be yours to eat, as with the green grasses I give you all of these. You must not, however, eat flesh with its lifeblood in it. But for your own lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. I will require it of every beast of man too. I will require a reckoning for human life of every man for that of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood be shed. For in his image did God make man. Be fertile then and increase, abound on the earth and increase on it. And God said to Noah and to his sons with him, <clears throat> I now establish my covenant with you and your offspring to come with every living thing that is with you, birds, cattle, and every wild beast as well. All that have come out of the ark, every living thing, and earth. I will maintain my covenant with you, and never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall, be, shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God further said, this is the sign that I set for the covenant between me and you and every living creature with you for all ages to come. I have set my 
bow in the clouds, and it shall serve as a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and every living creature among all flesh, so that the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living, living creatures, all flesh that is on earth. That, God said to Noah, shall be the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Thank you, Dave. And Jay, Isaac, would you like to read a little bit, starting at verse 18? Certainly. Thank you, Rabbi. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Ham being the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole world branched out. Noah, the tiller of the soil, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk, and he uncovered himself within his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a cloth, placed it against both their backs, and walking backward, they covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned the other way, so that they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah woke up from his wine and learned what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves shall be to his brothers. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, let Canaan be a slave to them. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be a slave to them. Noah lived after the flood 300 50 years, and all the days of Noah came to 950 years. Then he died. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Justin, would you like to read a little bit at the start of chapter 10? Thank you, Reverend. Yes. And these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog, and Madai and Javan, and Tubai, Tubal, and Meshech and Tiras. And the sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, and Rifat, and Togarma. And the sons of Javan were Elisha and Tarshish, Kitim, and Dodanim. From these, the islands of the nations separated in their lands, each one to his language, according to their families, in their nations. And the sons of Ham were Cush and Mitzrayim and Put and Canaan. And the sons of Cush were Seba and Havila, and Sabta and Ra'ama, and Sabtecha. And the sons of Ra'ama were Sheba and Dedan. And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty man in the land. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was uh, of his kingdom was Babylon, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kaine, in the land of Shinar. From that land emerged Ashur, mm -hmm. and he built Nineveh, and Rehobot, Ir, and Kala. And resin between Nineveh and between Kala. That is the great city. And Mitzrayim begot the Ludim, and the Anamim, and the Lehabim, and the Nafu, Naftuhim, and the Patrushrusim, and the Kasluhim from whom the Philistines emerged, and the Kaf 
Torim. Thank you so much, Jesse. We're on verse uh, 15 now. Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, and the Arbadites, and the Samarites, and the Hamathites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites spread out. The original Canaanite territory extended from Sidon as far as Gerar, near Gaza, and as far as Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, near Elisha. These are the descendants of Ham, according to their clans and languages, by their lands and nations. Sons were also born to Shem, ancestor of all the descendants of Eber and older brother of Japheth. The descendants of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Apashad, Lud, and Aram. The descendants of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Apashad begot Shelah, and Shelah begot Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of the first was Peleg, where in his days the earth was divided. And the name of his brother was Joktan, and Joktan begot Almodad, and Shelef, and Hazar Marvech, Shera, Hadoram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Chavila, and Jobab. All these were the descendants of Joktan. Their settlements extended from Mesha as far as Safar, the hill country to the east. These are the descendants of Shem according to their clans and languages, by their hands according to their nations. These are the groupings of Noah's descendants according to their origins, by their nations, and from these nations branched out over the earth after the flood. Richard, would you like to read a little bit the start of chapter 11? Thank you. All the earth had the same language and the same words. And of men migrated from the east, they came upon a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them hard. Bricks served them as a stone, and bitumen served them as mortar. And they said, come, let us build a city and a tower with its top in the sky to make a name for ourselves, else we shall be scattered all over the world. The Lord came down to look at the city and tower which man had built, and the Lord said, if as one people with one language for all, this is how they've begun to act, then nothing that they may propose to do will be out of their reach. Let me then go down and confound their speech there so that they shall not understand one another's speech. Thus the Lord scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel because there the Lord confounded the speech of the whole earth and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Thank you. Sherry, would you like to read a little bit, starting with verse 10? No, thank you. I'll butcher the words. <laughs> I, I, can want to, I think my pronunciation is... Uh, this is the line, is Shem. Shem was 100 years old when he begot our Paksha, two years after the flood. After the birth of our Paksha, Shem lived 500 years and begot sons and daughters. When Arpshaksha had lived 35 years, he begot Shelah. After the birth of Shelah, Arpaksha lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he begot Eber. After the birth of Eber, Shelah lived. 403 years and begot sons and daughters. <clears throat> when Eber had lived 34 years, he begot Pilah. After the birth of Pilah, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. When Pilah had lived 30 years, he begot Ru. After the birth of Ru, Pilah lived 209 years and begot sons and daughters. Thank you, Steve. Anna, would you like to read a little bit, beginning at verse 20? Oh, Ru had lived 32 years when he begot Sarug. After begetting Sarug, Ru lived 
207 years and he begot sons and daughters. So Ruth had lived 30 years when he begot Nahor. After begetting Nahor, Sarug lived 200 years and he begot sons and daughters. Nahor had lived 29 years when he begot Terah. After begetting Terah, Nahor lived 119 and he begot sons and daughters. Terah had lived 70 years when he begot Avram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the chronicle of Terah. Terah begot Avram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. Then Haran died in the presence of Terah, his father, in the land of his birth, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Avram and Nahor took wives. Avram's wife was named Sarai, and Nahor's wife was named Milcha, uh, daughter of Haran, father of Milcha and Yisha. And Sarai was barren. She had no offspring. Then Terah took his son Avram and his brother's son Lot of Haran and his daughter-in-law Sarai, and they all left Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But they got as far as Haran and settled there. The years of Terah's life came to 205. Then Terah died in Haran. Thank you. And thank you all very much, everyone. That's our Torah tour portion for the week full of all kinds of very, very dramatic tales. So what I'd like to do is just share with you a little bit of focus study, and then we'll open it up for everyone to have an opportunity to share his or her thoughts and reflections about the portion. If you have the study sheet, you can pull it out. And you see that I've entitled this study session, Brokenness and True Wholeness. And there's a, a very stunning graphic uh, that's at the very top. It's an acrylic by the artist Ali Bursali, and we'll, we'll come back to that uh, during the course of, of our study. The verse that I chose as the kickoff point for this particular focus study comes from chapter 11, uh, verse four. Come, let us build a city and a tower with its top in the sky to make a name for ourselves, else we shall be scattered all over the world. So the way the narrative sets this up is that it seems that all of humanity after the flood gathers together into this central point and they engage in this um, common project, which is to build this great tower. And everyone's speaking the same language and they're all engaged in this common purpose of, of building this tower. And then for some reason or other, according to the text, uh, the source of, of all becomes disturbed by this, thinks there's something wrong with this and, and destroys their tower and scatters everyone and uh, causes everyone to be speaking different languages so they can't understand one another. So there's kind of provocative to try and understand, well, what was so wrong with, with what was happening there with this Tower of Babel? Everyone seemed to be understanding one another, speaking the same language, engaged in a common purpose, this project? What was it that was uh, caused God, according to the story, to upset all of this? Well, there's lots of Midrash about this. And essentially, uh, what, what the Midrash describes is that the, the apparent unity of purpose and the apparent univocality, that is that they're all speaking the same language, was actually, uh, uh, if you will, hiding uh, a, a deep degree of, of violence and oppression. So the Midrash talks about this project of building this tower and describes it as sometimes in the course of this enormous building project that was going on, someone from Great Hype would fall down and die. And the response of those who remained was just to kind of shrug their shoulders. But when a brick fell, everyone would cry out, oh no, we've lost a brick. Where are we going to find another brick? And so this is indicating in this Midrash that what people were focused on was their, uh, their accomplishments, their success, 
uh, rather than anything having to do with compassion or care for their fellow human beings. And the, when the word brick is used here in our story of Tower of Babel, it will remind us, for those who have read the story ahead, uh, of the Israelites' time in Egypt, when the Israelites were, were burdened with having to make bricks in order to make these structures for Pharaoh that would, that would speak about the power uh, and the might and, and the supposed divinity of, of Pharaoh. So bricks convey something very negative uh, within this tradition. So the fact that these, according to Marish, these bricks are being valued more than human existence is indicative about the level and degree of oppression and violence that was being, if you will, uh, hidden by the apparency of unity of purpose and, and unity of, of language. So uh, what happens is this homogenization, if you will, of the potential for diversity of language uh, becomes a system in which words only have single meaning, that they only have one meaning only. And this is a story about the dangers of hegemony, whether it is hegemony of language or hegemony of social class or hegemony of project, which can sometimes lead to the exclusion of other possibilities and can lead to violence and oppression which is what the Midrash is trying to point out. So uh, this notion about this elevation of um, arrogance, which is what the story is, is describing, this arrogance and the displacement of other possibilities is raised later in our uh, Bible in the first book of Kings, which is what we have in number two on our, our study sheet. This is uh, the, the context for what we're going to be reading about from the first book of Kings is that King David at this point in the story is now on his deathbed. And, and there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of concern and disagreement about who is going to succeed him as king. So we enter into uh, verse five of, from the first chapter of the first book of Kings. Adonijah, son of Hagit, exalted himself to say, I will be king, Ani Emloch. He provided himself with chariots and horses and an escort of 50 outrunners. So in this story with David on his deathbed, one of his sons, Adonijah, whose name means uh, my Lord is God, Yah. One of his sons, Adonijah, unbeknownst to King David, has uh, decided that he's going to be the heir apparent. And as a result of having made that decision, he uh, acquires uh, uh, lots of chariots, a large entourage, and then he arranges for a ritual to uh, announce his claim to the throne. And in the story, he excludes another one of King David's sons, that of Solomon, from participating or attending this ritual. And the tradition reads all of this as an awareness. Adonijah is very aware that what he's doing here is effectively usurping the throne, not waiting for David to make his announcement as to who will be the, who will be the heir to the, to the kingdom. And what ends up happening is that David appoints Solomon uh, to be uh, his heir as king. And as a result, Adonijah has to flee along with his supporters. Um, and eventually uh, he's killed uh, as a potential usurper and effectively a, a, as a result of committing an act of treason. So Adonijah in this storytelling represents uh, this source of pride and pretension and arrogance and elevating himself um, to, be, uh, to be sovereign. 
So this phrase, Adonai Imloch, I will be king, is representative of an attitude that seeks to propel oneself above others, uh, one who's concerned primarily with his own success rather than the welfare of the community. So what we're going to be doing is exploring another way for the elevation of the self rather than the way of either the people of Babel or of Adonisia. And for that, we're going to turn to a, a, ninth, a late 19th century, early 20th century French poet, Paul Valéry. Um, so let me just uh, provide you a little bit of background about Paul Valéry before we read what he uh, says that's written here on number three in the study sheet. So for Paul Valéry as a poet, what he became concerned about was that uh, the danger of words becoming finite and fixed. In other words, obtaining some kind of hegemony over meaning. And he, for him and for other poets like him, words are valuable because of their many possibilities of meaning and because of the ambiguities that they provide, which then invite participation by all of us to help to extract meaning from them. So for him, words are rich when they have multiple dimensions, multiple possibilities, rather than singular in, in their approach. So uh, he, uh, he wrote this, God made everything out of nothing, but the nothing shows through. In exploring a little bit about Paul Valerian in preparation for our study session, I was, came across a wonderful thread of discussion uh, online. And the, um, the credit for this particular bit of commentary that I'm gonna share with you next uh, is just identified by a man named Lucas. He didn't provide a last name, but it's a very rich, I think, interpretation. He wrote this. For Valeri, the goal of poetry was to invent a literature that could transmit nothing. He viewed language as deceptively assertive or determinative, that to say something is to posit it there as fully formed. He was more interested in getting outside this concept of language so as to transmit not ideas of something, but the nothingness around and within things, to make space for the silence inside language. The poem is supposed to open up a space for the object's nothingness to resonate with the nothingness inside the readers, not the reader's ego or self or understanding. In a sense, I think what Lucas is trying to help us understand about what Paul Valeri's enterprise is all about is in the fact he's trying to fracture the hegemony that language sometimes has. And by hegemony, we mean the, the dominion of a single meaning in, in language, or hegemony, the, the dominion, the domination that one group can have over uh, an entire nation. So, and for Valeri, to be able to do that, to be able to fracture the he hegemony that a word or that a group might have brings us closer to the nothing that is the source of everything. The more that we engage in a singular understanding of anything, the more that we build a society in which one group has total control over everything, that takes us further and further away from attachment to the source of all existence. So what I'd like to do is if you have the sheet, I'd like you to turn over and we're going to explore a little bit of Hasidic uh, appreciation uh, that's along the same line. So for number four is from uh, one of the uh, early Hasidic rabbis, Rabbi Yaakov of Ishbik Radzin. Uh, and he is the son, he was born about 1818, lived to about oh, 1878. And he's the son of the founder of what's known as the Itzbika. Uh, Hasidic tradition, uh, that is Rabbi Mordechai Yosef. 
And Rabbi Yaakov was a very uh, in, interested in issues about selfhood, personal growth, emotional relationships. And, and he writes this about the story of creation, number four. The very purpose of creation was that all would be compelled to ask who created all these? That all would know clearly that a supreme force in its goodness is sovereign of the world and none would make a claim to autonomous power. To that end, God planted in each entity some lack, a fissure in its being, making them all incomplete. So here is Rabbi Yaakov say, the intention of God was to instill within each one of us some lack, because when we have that lack, then we're seeking somehow to, to find out why do I have this lack and what do I need to do in order to uh, make myself more fulfilled? And there is a, there's a blessing that actually thanks God for creating each one of us with some kind of deficiency. So here, here's the blessing. There are three possible blessings that one can recite after eating a meal. Uh, one of them is the Birkat Hamazon, which is what many of us are most familiar with. And that's the blessing that one recites after one has eaten a meal that includes bread. Then there's another uh, blessing uh, that's known as the th three faceted blessing in which uh, one recites that after one has had a meal that consists of mezunot foods. That is uh, food that's made from either wheat or barley or rye or smelt, spelt or oat, uh, but is not consisting of dough, which is what bread is. And then there's a third blessing called the more nefeshot, which is kind of a miscellaneous blessing. And that's a blessing that we recite after we've had a meal that doesn't include bread and includes uh, vegetables or meats or other kinds of foods that's not covered by one of the first two blessings. So this is the Bere Nefeshot blessing that I've shared with you uh, in number five. <clears throat> and the translation is this. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, creator of numerous living beings and their deficiencies for all the things you have created with which to sustain the soul of every living being. Blessed is the one who is the life of the world. So the word that's used for, uh, that I translate as deficiencies in our Hebrew is uh, the hesronan, which comes from the Hebrew chaser, which means to lack or be diminished. So we're thanking God for our lacking things. We're like thanking God for being diminished in some kind of way, for having some kind of deficiency. So here's what one of the great rabbis from the 19th century says about uh, this being uh, deficient in some kind of way. And it's from the Chofetz Chaim. Everything with a soul is in need. And that is a good thing. So I think what the Chofetz Chaim is hinting at is that uh, to seek the world through our awareness of fracture is to be aware of others. Though the extreme opposite, of course, is to be someone who is so self-absorbed as to be unconcerned and virtually unaware of others, which is what's being described in the Midrash about the Tao of Babel, which is that people only cared about the, if you will, the, the transactional use that they can make of another human being, which was to be a builder. But when that, when that person fell, was injured, or even killed, they didn't even take notice. All they cared about was the brick. That's what was most important. So the, the Chovetz Chaim is pointing out that when you are aware of the fractured nature of the world, when you're aware that you don't possess everything, when you are deficient in some kind of way, that enables you to be open 
to others, to be aware of others. And when you're aware of others, then you can begin to create a real sense of fullness. In number seven, I want to take this a little bit further, and it's going to take us to a reading that we did a couple of weeks ago during Shabbat Chol Chamoed, Sukkot, where we looked at this wonderful text about Moses asking God to, to see God's presence. So to remind ourselves about that verse, in number seven, we read from Exodus chapter 33, Moses said, oh, let me behold your presence. And God answered, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you the name yud heh vav -Hey, and the grace that I will grant and the compassion that I show. But you cannot see my face. I will put you in a cleft of the rock and shield you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I will make, then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back. Ahorai. We talked a little bit about that notion about Ahorai, and what that might mean. So to, up, above that, I have the Hebrew for the, the basis for this word. So we have the word acher, which means an other, achar, which means behind, and then built on the same root, we have achrayut, responsibility. So from all that, I want to suggest that what the Torah is saying in chapter 33, when the text has God say, you'll see Ahorai, what you'll see in a sense is you will experience my otherness and my, my trait of responsibility. That's what I think that Hebrew is trying to express, that one becomes aware of otherness one also becomes aware of one's responsibility for the world around one, that one is not self-contained, that the world is made through appreciation that there is otherness in the, in the world. So now, if you want to look at the painting that's on the, the front, this is a painting, and the title of it is, in Persian is hik, which means null. It's a bit of, of uh, calligraphy of this word hik. And in Islamic mysticism, this notion of hik, of, of null, uh, seeks to describe the relationship between the omnipresence of the universe and its absence, the never ending, infinite, and incomprehensible depth of God's existence that that's where one finds God, within the null set, if, if you might. And so we go back now to Valer, uh, our Paul, Paul Valeri, who said, um, this is where one finds true meaning. When one shatters the hegemony of a single possibility and sees the multiple dimensions and possibility, when one shatters the notion that there's but one social class that could have hegemony over all the world and sees all of us as participating in the great enterprise of life. Within Jewish mysticism, we have the, the phrase that it's, it's, one, it's hard to make something out of nothing, which is what is attributed to the source of all life, God, to make something out of nothing. Much harder, uh, Jewish mysticism says, is to make nothing out of something, which is what we have to do. That is, we're born with this ego, and it's all too easy to become uh, Babel builders, to exclude others, to have just a single viewpoint about uh, the world, to have just uh, attach single meanings to, to words themselves and to have just a, an ego approach that what matters is me and myself and I. So the, the way to access uh, the source of all existence is to begin to shatter those ego-centered notions uh, about the world. And here's the way that the great uh, Jewish uh, philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas puts it in an ethical sense in number nine. 
I approach the infinite insofar as I forget myself for my neighbor who looks at me. A you is inserted between the I and the absolute he. So for Levinas, the access point, the portal, if you will, to encountering God is to encounter another. And that another awakens oneself to this, as we say in the Hebrew, achrayut, the sense of responsibility. The other evokes a sense of responsibility. And in the Hebrew, you can see how that is because it's built upon the same root word there. So this is um, the access point to achieving false holiness, if you will, is to shut out others, to build the Tower of Babel, to have a sense of arrogance uh, and to displace others. But that ultimately in, in the emotional life leads to a sense of ongoing kind of sense of emptiness and always seeking to, to acquire more things, to build more things, to, to feed the ego, which is never satisfied. And instead, the, the portal to true wholeness is to first have a sense of brokenness, fracture, humility, to give away. And when one does that, one becomes richer, more fuller, more complete, grander, larger, more purposeful than one could ever, ever imagine. So with that, I'd love to hear other thoughts, reflections, uh, provocations, questions that arose uh, for you during the reading of our Torah portion. If you'd like to raise your hand, I would so love to call on you. Thank you. June, go ahead and unmute and share with us. I always find it so interesting that they always mention the sons. There's no mention of daughters, and yet you always have births. And then again, they have they mention the firstborn, I guess, the son, and then and there were other children. And then it go then they lived so many years. And then again, the, the firstborn son is mentioned. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you never hear about the daughters. I always find that very interesting that the woman is not relevant, so it seems. So this is what it means to be a, a reader of a text, a viewer of a painting, a listener to, to music, which is to, to appreciate that there's more that's going on than the, the black letter words, than the specific brush strokes uh, on a painting, or perhaps even the, the notes that, the, that are on the, the sheet of music, which is there's other things that are happening there. Sometimes they're the in-between spaces between all of that, which has risen to the surface. And our job as viewers and readers and listeners is to, if you will, bring what's in the white space up to the, up to the forefront. So that's what we do as the readers of the text. We know there are other lives here, which didn't make it to the black letter in many cases, but the lives are there. And, and so it's part of our imagination is to, to bring them to, to the forefront. So thank you for, for mentioning that thing. Uh, Mark Thompson, go ahead and unmute and share with us. Okay, hi. I love the discussion about Acher, about the other. And um, it occurs to me that sometimes when we seek a partner in life, we seek someone who fulfills those aspects of our personalities that are lacking. Um, and, and so to me, that's a very profound statement that we're always looking for something that completes us, not just with partners, but with friends. Uh, I just think that's a beautiful thought, uh, number one. Number two, to completely change the subject. If we're talking about hegemony of language, I've always been disturbed by the number of years that are attributed to our uh, ancestors. They seem very unrealistic. And so I ask you and everybody, is there something behind these numbers? Because you can't, you have to question the veracity of somebody who lives 785 years. So is there some kind of a, I don't know, numerical explanation in Jewish mysticism or something that allows us to look at the language in a different way? I, lo I love this question, Mark. So uh, you're questioning the veracity, uh, the accurateness, 
the literalness of the numbers for these years, right? Yes. Have you, do you question the veracity of anything else in the text that we've read? <laughs> well, I mean, you could look at everything from a, the standpoint of a metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about a number, I mean, that's a fixed concept. We all think of 785, and that means something to us. There's really not a lot that you can debate about that number, is there? Unless there's a hidden meaning there, and I have a feeling that maybe there is, and I just don't know what it is. Okay, thank you. David, you look very excited. Go ahead and unmute and, and, and share with us. Uh, well, of course, there's Jewish numerology that finds all kinds of hidden meanings inside of numbers. Have you found it? Have I found the hidden meaning? <laughs> <laughs> no, but but I'm I'm excited that just that it never occurred to me before that the point of of numerology, Jewish numerology is to say it is not 985, and that's all it means. It doesn't mean anything except a very specific number of somethings, right? And you can debate about the somethings, but that that meaning, how many there are of them, doesn't change. The Jewish numerology say, oh no, 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 there's way more to it than that. Here's some of the things it means because those numbers actually also make a word, or at least a series of letters right. that can make a variety of words. So it never occurred to me before that it was an attack on this numerical hegemony. Great name for a rock and roll band. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anna, do you want to say something? Well, yes, Dave, you're, you're onto it. You know, like every, every word is made up of letters and every number is a letter. And, and you can combine those letters into universes of words, I think, you know? So here's an, in, what would be really interesting to do would be just pick out something like 900 or 752 or, you know, pick a number and then look at uh, what that number stands for and, and what those letters stand for. I bet you there's a million stories there. But, you know, what Mark, when you were saying like, how, how could someone live to be 900 years or why, why are they saying that? In the very same senses that they say some of these guys lived, you know, a Shalal lived 403 years and he begot sons and daughters. And then so-and-so lived for eh, 30 years and begot sons and daughters or 27 years and begot sons, you know, right in the middle of that, of that role, that recitation of names and numbers, you have people, guys having families at an age that we would consider yeah. within the realm of reason. And then we, then we flip out to these, uh, very interesting. Okay, I'm gonna just study about Good. that. <laughs> and if you're looking for like a, a, a practical, uh, um, objective way of the way people try to understand the writings, one, thing that occurs to me is like I have an ancestor I'm really proud of uh, but I don't remember all the ones in between you know I remember my father and my grandfather and I remember a great grandfather this is my great 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 grandfather and I don't rem I know when he lived it was 208 years ago but <laughs> and I want to include him into my family story so maybe I just claim he lived from 1755 until 1910, when I, my great grandfather was born. <laughs> David, let me ask Dave Lay. You have you'd like to share something? Go ahead. Yeah. If you look at my backdrop, which I picked for today, I think it's kind of perfect because in that backdrop I see two arcs. One is an arc with a K, and the other is an arc with a C. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you look at the arc with the sea, the rainbow, uh, the rainbow is kind of a uh, structural thing. That's how bridges are made. Bridges are made in arcs, so it's uh, so bridges don't fall. And the first two parshas that we have are really fantasy. Fantastic things happen. People live to be hundreds of years. Things just are created out of nothing. <clears throat> And it kind of arcs over to the third Parsha where we start Judaism with uh, Abraham. And uh, this is the arc that arcs us over. Mm. And uh, th this is why I think this is uh, uh, 
a good transition, you know, from the fantastic to what you can imagine that are down to real people. That's lovely, Dave. Thank you. I hadn't thought of it that way. It's really lovely. Paul, go ahead and unmute, Paul. I'm gonna I'm gonna go along with Anna de Robinson because she started with the business of the, the words and the letters. I'm gonna go one step further. In Europe, you have the comma and, and uh, to separate numbers. United States, we use the dot. And so uh, if you think about the poor calligrapher who's doing all this stuff and the, there's so much ink in the inkwell that uh, there is a comma, or maybe not a comma, but at least the dot disappeared. So that's my contribution to numerology. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. And others, any other uh, shares, thoughts, reflections? Justin has his hand up. J and Jay Iser. Justin has his hand up. Uh, oh, thank you very much. So go ahead, Justin, and then Jay. Thanks. Um, I was just thinking that, I mean, this way of approaching numbers seems to, there, the, the mind has to start circling around a specific number. And then just the collection and developing a, I guess, a spiritual attitude toward whatever number you've, you've start to have a relationship with. Uh, and then you can look it up on Gematria or any of those uh, avenues. And there's online Gematria, right? Just, but do you have to see what number is actually sticking? That's more of a synchronistic approach to it in the Jungian sense of synchronicity, that you have to see what starts to keep on repeating itself and circling around. One other piece, this is just, a, this came into our family and I wanted to share it. This is a, this is a, a, a sort of a polycarbon or resin uh, arc. And it was presented to our family as an arc. And I just wanted it's a, a, a sculptural piece that was just, or stylization. Modern, it's a, like a, a Brancusi or something like that. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for sharing yes. that. Wow. And, and Jay Iser. Well, this is the time of year when we can thank George and Ira Gershwin. It ain't necessarily so. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. When no girl will give it, you know, man, what is 900 years? <laughs> Thank you, Jay. It Thank is, you. ain't necessarily so. Thank uh, you. I think, I really think that um, that changed my thinking, that type of thinking is, uh, Rabbi, was there not that thing in Inherit the Wind or something? How long is a day? Wasn't that the big thing in the, in the trial of, you know, yes. the creation right. was so many years and days. So, um, you know, this, this adds up, up, up against the allegory because if you get yourself tied down, and I was discussing this earlier today, if you get yourself tied down with the historical or the mathematical or the analytical details, what you're doing is you're filling your brain and not allowing that space, as you talked about, you're not allowing to say, wait a minute, where does this, what's between all these things? What, what is the meaning of all of this? And uh, so, so uh, you know, take it with a grain of salt, meaning that it all requires salt, just don't turn into a pillar of salt. But that's in the next couple of uh, chapters, isn't it? I better not... Well, while we've been while we've been sharing this, one thought that's been going through my mind is that when I read Torah, anyway, uh, I read it as a work of art, uh, and and as you were talking, Jay, I was thinking about a particular movement in art known as action painting, which is kind of what Jackson Pollock and some of the other early uh, abstract expressionists were all about, and. For them, the actual work of art wasn't the can what the what was on the canvas. The actual work of art was their act of producing what was on the canvas. And so the what was on the canvas was meant to try and be a 
an expression of their art of movement. And so to, to try and look at the canvas and, and just look at it as something that was now done and settled and on a canvas, I think, missed the point of what they wanted you to uh, understand and experience, which was their the act of their painting. That's what was meaningful. To, the magic to, is in the doing. The magic is in the doing, which is what uh, our wonderful artist Norman Gabati talked about. So, so sometimes when we're looking at the text, we get uh, stuck with what's on the page rather than what's behind uh, how it came to be on, on the page. Okay, so with that, let, let me end that soon. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe they just wanted to make the Tanakh shorter. So they just said, this guy lived so many years Let's let's fill these nine hundred years of this guy's life, and then let's move on to the next. Rather than putting in ten lives, they just put in one. <laughs> kind of a reader's digest version. Thank you, <laughs> and Susan. So, um, a month or so ago, I wrote a note to a, a friend of mine, actually Kathy Hagerman, and um, she's a quilting maven maven master mm -hmm. and so she's been helping me and i made a quilt for my granddaughter and i've been wanting to make a quilt for my grandson mm -hmm. and i found this let me see if you can see it let me hold it for you i found that piece and that's and i decided it was so colorful and had so much in it that i was going to use that and so i had written to her and i said i'd like to make a noah's art quilt and it wasn't until today that she responded, and it's been at least a month. And she said, well, I don't know why you, I would never want, to, what she said was, I would never want to make a quilt about a biblical story. And then she also sent me this wonderful piece on Noah and Noah's Ark and how, you know, we tell it as a children's story but there's a whole bunch in there, a lot of which isn't very nice. And my response to this piece was, and to Kathy, was to realize how excited I was about making a Noah's Ark quilt because it was something that he, the story could be embellished in different ways as he grows and can understand a different aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So instead of just being stuck as a children's story, it could come up again and again and be elaborated. So it's, it's lovely. It's lovely. And, and you're, it, it is, of course, uh, far beyond a children's story. It is also such an adult story because one of the remarkable things about the story of Noah in terms of words is that he doesn't speak. He doesn't speak until after the flood. He doesn't speak. And the very first words that he speaks are curse words. Mm -hmm. you know? So it is, it is as if the source of all existence is trying to get him to speak by saying, I'm gonna build, a, I'm gonna bring about a flood. And it's as if God is saying, what do you think about that? Uh, do you want me to do that? And Noah doesn't say anything. Uh, and then God says, build an ark. And kind of waiting for Noah to say, well, an ark, really? And, you know, am I the only one that you're asking to do that? Uh, and then bring aboard, you know, just your family. Waiting to for Noah to say, just my family? But this what? makes me feel really a lot better. Mm -hmm. I mean, really. What What about my next door neighbor, Sam? Sam was so nice. He, he lent me his lawnmower. <laughs> and he's a nice guy. Can't I bring him on board? No, but no, it doesn't say anything about that. And so he is totally incurious and seems to be unconcerned. And if you will, is foreshadowing this Babel building project where he's going about building this thing, but this thing that he's building uh, he is somehow oblivious to the fact that the rest of the world is not going to be able to come on board. 
And, and so as a result of his lack of speech, the fact that he suppresses his curiosity, the fact that he suppresses any language having to do with curiosity or inquisitiveness or, or questioning, any the supp complete suppression of language is that when he finally speaks, out comes words of damnation. So it's a lesson that to the extent we, we suppress all, all of this speech, uh, we suppress it uh, when it finally erupts, it's, it's, it's not going to be helpful. It, it might not be helpful. It might not be helpful. The, the Bible also says, the Torah also says, Noah walked with God. Enoch and Noah walked with God. So what does it mean to say you walk with God and you don't tell your neighbor the flood is coming? And the first words out of your mouth are not thank you, God, for saving us and bringing us here, but cursing your own son. Now, I like to, I like to know that, note that it wasn't God who cursed the son, it was the father. And somehow God really cared. That's why I said I really liked what he was saying. I wasn't being facetious. I'm thinking, you know, I have so many flaws, but when you look at, when you list Noah's like that, it, he doesn't sound very good, but God walked with him. I, so what does that mean without words? So let, let me, let me, uh, let me wrap this up. I appreciate everyone having spent, spent a little bit of extra time. So uh, the, the lesson here about the, the notion of nullity, uh, the, the notion about becoming aware of otherness is that by experiencing otherness, which awakens our sense of responsibility, that's the portal through which we can experience the source of all existence and gain fulfillment. So with that, thank you all very much. God bless you all. Look forward to more studies together. I learned so much when we studied together and immerse yourselves in words of Torah. Thank you. Be well. God bless. Thank you. Have a great Bye, Rabbi. Thank you.